What is going on guys? It's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our microbiology and infectious diseases playlist. In the last videos, we talked about Listeria and Diphtheria. Today, let's talk about Clostridia, which include four famous and clinically significant Clostridia. You have Clostridium tetani, you have Clostridium botulinum, you have Clostridium perfringens, and Clostridium difficile. Clostridium tetani causes tetanus, Clostridium botulinum causes botulism, Clostridium perfringens causes myonecrosis and gas gangrene, and the ugly, difficult Clostridium difficile causes pseudomembranous colitis, which could be complicated with toxic megacolon. Now, let's get started. This is my microbiology and infectious diseases playlist. Please watch these videos in order. Clostridia are gram-positive rods. Are they spore-forming? Yes, they are. Are they aerobic or anaerobic? Mostly anaerobic. Mostly strictly anaerobic. They only live and survive and multiply in the lack of oxygen. Are they motile or immotile? Well, it depends. Mostly they are motile, such as Clostridium tetani, Clostridium botulinum, and Clostridium difficile. Only one is non-motile, which is Clostridium perfringens. Only one that you should care about. But of course, there are gazillion other clostridia. So again, they are gram-positive rods. They are spore-forming. They are strictly anaerobic, mostly motile. But only one is non-motile. Clostridium tetani causes tetanus. Tetanus has a toxin known as tetanus toxin or tetanospasmin. It causes spasms because it inhibits the inhibitory GABA. When you inhibit the inhibitory, you become excitatory, i.e. more spasticity, spastic paralysis, spasm, tetanospasmin. Clostridium botulinum is the opposite. It causes flaccid paralysis. How come? It inhibits the release of acetylcholine from the presynaptic neuron. When you have no acetylcholine, you have no action potential at the postsynaptic muscle or motor end plate, and you will have flaccid paralysis, i.e. no spasms, no contraction. Clostridium difficile causes pseudomembranous colitis, the famous AB toxin. Toxin A is intertoxin, toxin B is cytotoxin. As for Clostridium perfringens, it's the classic story of a soldier hitting another soldier with a sword. The victim fell on the ground. His wound got contaminated with the soil. Since Clostridia live in the soil, they are ubiquitous in the soil, Clostridium perfringens went from the soil to his open wound, causing myonecrosis and gas gangrene. This requires too much oxygen to try to manage it to the point of putting the patient in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Why would you do that? Because the bacteria is anaerobic, doofus. So in order to treat it, you put the patient in a very aerobic environment. You do the exact opposite of the disease. Thing. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Again, Clostridia are gram-positive rods. They are spore-forming, anaerobic, mostly motile. One is immotile. If you want to be a good student, bring a piece of paper and draw all of this from scratch, from memory. Clostridia are spore-forming organisms because making spores is a characteristic of some gram-positive bacteria under some circumstances. When the circumstances become unfavorable, these bacteria will make a spore to protect them from the unfavorable conditions. When the conditions go back to being favorable, the spore will disappear and the bacteria will go back to the vegetative dividing replicating state. So when the environment is favorable, I'm in the vegetative state, so to speak. I'm dividing and germinating like crazy. And that's why your spermatogonia and oogonia are known as germ cells, because they divide like crazy. Huh, it makes sense. But these bacteria, during unfavorable conditions, when there is no food around, no nutrition, the bacteria will surround itself by a spore, known as endospore. The bacteria is not dividing. The bacteria is in a state of suspended animation. No change. The bacteria is frozen. Not germinating. But when the conditions go back to becoming favorable, I will leave the spore and become vegetative once more. What are the contents of the spore? They are here and they were discussed before in my video called spores. To review, complete copy of the bacterial chromosome, essential proteins and ribosomes, the bare minimum important for survival, 
and lots of calcium bound to dipiclonic acid. Calcium is the hero of cohesion. Not just in the bacterial spore, but also in your bones. Your bones have calcium because calcium is for cohesion. From the inside to the outside, here are the contents of the spore. On the very inside, there is the DNA of the bacteria, and then the cytoplasm of the bacteria, and then the inner membrane of the bacteria. Remember the plasma membrane? Yes, after this, what do we have? Do you remember the cell wall? Yeah, peptidoglycan, baby, in two layers. And here is a pearl for the pros. Recall that spores are only made by gram-positives, and gram-positives have a thick peptidoglycan wall. That's why they are two layers. It was thick to begin with. Followed by an outer protein coat made of keratin, which is very strong. Look at your nails and hair. Why are they strong? keratin baby when the bacteria discovers that the surrounding environment is unfavorable how long does it take to make a spore about seven hours after making the spore if the bacteria discovered that we are in a favorable environment how long does it take to get rid of the spore only one and a half hours it's easier to destroy than to build civilization that was deep. As deep as the bacterial DNA that's buried deep inside the spore. So all of this was the structure of the spore. Tell me about the function of the spore. It protects the bacterial DNA from heat, chemicals, and enzymes. Clinically speaking, it helps doctors identify the bacteria. Because when you look in the lab and you find a spore, you can bet the rent money these are only some type of gram-positive. It cannot be gram-negative because only some gram-positives are capable of making a spore. So it helps us identify the organism of concern. What's the classic definition of clostridia? They have to be gram-positive, strictly anaerobic, making endospores, and unable to reduce sulfate into sulfite. This was the old definition. This definition is good, but it's not very accurate. Why? Because we have exceptions. In fact, some clostridia are gram-negative. Oh, I cannot believe it. Example is Clostridium ramosum. Moreover, not all of them are strictly anaerobic. In fact, some species of Clostridia are aerotolerant. They can live with oxygen, such as Clostridium histolyticum. I cannot believe it. My papa drives a Rolls Royce. But wait, there is more. Not all of them make endospores. In fact, some of them rarely ever make a spore. Case in point, Clostridium perfringens. Yeah, the one that caused muscle necrosis and gas gangrene when you fell on the soil. It rarely makes pores. Why are Clostridia such a big deal to human beings? Because they can lead to pathology. Why is it easy for them to cause pathology to humans? Thanks to their endospores, thanks to being anaerobic, i.e. capable of surviving even when oxygen is absent. And they can produce toxins. Case in point, case in point, tetanus toxin, botulinum toxin, etc. Clostridia are ubiquitous. They are everywhere around you, in water, sewage, and soil. They are part of your normal flora, especially in your gut. Mostly harmless saprophytes, but they can turn against you. What the flip does saprophyte mean? Sapro means dead, and phyte means plant. Because saprophyte is an organism that lives upon dead decaying organisms, such as dead plants. This is equivalent to the word necroparasite, which is something that lives on parasites on dead cells. Here are the clinically relevant clostridia that we'll discuss in the next videos. So please pause and review. If you like this video, you will enjoy my antibiotics course at medicosisperfectionetis.com to teach you about antibacterials, antifungals, antivirals, and antiparasitic medications. I also have a surgery high yields course and an emergency medicine high yields course on my website. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionetis, where medicine makes perfect sense.